you for attending the final event in our Saturday grand opening day of festivities. It's been a, a wonderful uh, journey the past few years putting together this building and this museum. And uh, I think the perfect group of individuals is here tonight to speak uh, to the success of our project and uh, the, the purpose of, of why we've done this, and that is to highlight some of the stories that have not gotten the proper attention that they've deserved in the past. That's the story of our community, the story of uh, um, Bill's work, really, which is now featured in our changing exhibit, uh, and, and so many other things that, that are just important to the, the story of our community and, and uh, the collection that we preserve here, a million plus items right behind me in our archives and, re and research room, which are now safe and protected forever. So thank you all for being part of that by being here tonight. I will turn things over shortly to, to my friend here, Gary Edelman, who will be the, the primary moderator for the discussion that we're gonna have tonight about Gettysburg, early photography at Gettysburg, and the title of tonight's discussion, which is based off of Bill's first book, Gettysburg, A Journey in Time. I hope all of you, if you haven't already, will take an opportunity to, to look at the changing exhibit downstairs and the, the museum, Gettysburg Beyond the Battle. Um, so let me introduce the, our panel tonight, starting on this end of the table, Gary Edelman, who's the author and co-author or editor of more than 30 books. I already read this description once today, but uh, for those of you who haven't heard it, he is also the vice president of the Center for Civil War Photography. He's a licensed battlefield guide, and he is the chief historian at the American Battlefield Trust, a wonderful organization that we partner with all the time. Thank you for being here, Gary. Thank you. And then we have Bill Frazzanito, uh, the guest of honor this evening. He is a renowned photographic historian, and the author of seven books that transformed our understanding of Gettysburg and the Civil War. He pioneered a hybrid field of study that has inspired generations of students and historians, including all of our guests on this panel this evening. Frasnio's groundbreaking work has won prestigious awards. He's been recognized in national publications and has aided the federal government through his work in restoring key features on the Gettysburg battlefield. <laughs> Next we have Sue Boardman, author and historian. She's a Gettysburg licensed battlefield guide and a board trustee with the Adams County Historical Society. Her books include The Gettysburg Cyclorama, A History and Guide, The Gettysburg Cyclorama, a Turning Point of the, Ameri of the Civil War on Canvas, and Elizabeth Thorne, wartime caretaker of Gettysburg's Evergreen Cemetery. And before her career in history, she served 23 years as an ER nurse. So Sue is multi-talented. <laughs> <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, our official Adams County historian at the end of the uh, panel. Uh, he is a longtime, Tim Smith is a longtime battlefield guide at Gettysburg, author of 10 books and several dozen articles about Gettysburg and Adams County history. He is the Director of Education here at the Adams County Historical Society, and uh, I've already mentioned, but was recently named our official county historian, which is a position only held by one individual in the past, Dr. Charles Glatfelter, our longtime director, whose picture hangs in the room behind me. Uh, it's an, now an honor to call Tim our official county historian. Thank you, Tim. Before I turn things over to the panel, I just want to speak a little bit more about this exhibit that we put together. It all started during the pandemic in 2020, and we had some conversations, actually some walks around the Gettysburg College campus with Sue and Bill and myself, and we were thinking about, you know, in addition to this museum, what could we do that would really be a draw for not just Civil War enthusiasts, but uh, the local community? And, and tying those two things together under one subject uh, was the goal. And we talked a lot about how can we use, you know, artifacts that have not been seen before. Our museum has f is filled with artifacts that have never been public publicly displayed. But we wanted uh, to do something special with with some items that uh, of great significance that had never been seen before. And that led us to the idea of asking Bill to put his collection on loan uh, for a special exhibit in our building for the grand opening. And Bill graciously agreed. And then I think there there were months of back and forth where Sue and Tim and I and Gary later on in the process began to develop a script and began to 
go through Bill's items and, and, and look at you know, these photographs. Some of them, in fact, one of Abraham Lincoln riding in the procession to the National Cemetery to give the Gettysburg Address, a photo that had never been scanned before Bill brought it into our office. Uh, so one of the most <laughs> exciting moments for, for me personally was to put that on the scanner bed and blow it up and look at Lincoln. Um, but that's just one of many items in this exhibit, and uh, it speaks to Bill's work over the years in bringing attention uh, to the history of Civil War photography, but also pioneering, as I mentioned, a, a hybrid field of study where these photographs are used as historical documents, not just as illustrations in a history book. And that is what Bill's work is all about. Uh, he has inspired thousands who continue to take his books across the Gettysburg battlefield around the town of Gettysburg to line up the famous then and now photograph, which I, I believe maybe Bill first coined that term, uh, oh. then and now photographs. Um, and his two of his books called Gettysburg Then and Now and Then and Now Companion. Um, so to start it off, and then I'll let uh, I'll turn things over to Gary to kind of guide the conversation. I, I, I was hoping each of you could talk about the moment that hooked you uh, on, on Gettysburg, on history, and in particular on historic photographs. What was it? And for many of you, I, I'm sure it will have a lot to do with Bill. So let me start with, uh, with Gary, and maybe we'll go down the table. I'm going to hand you this mic, and, and we'll continue the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. And just real quick, because he's doing all the introductions, how about a hand for Andrew Dalton for getting this place built and everything like that? Thanks, everyone. What a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is easy, uh, and I think you might hear this answer from others. Uh, I'm here today, and my whole life changed because of Bill and his work. Uh, my last day of my sophomore year of high school, I picked up his Antietam book. I was a D history student. I had no thought that I would make this my life's work. No thought that there were pictures taken that long ago. And I picked up Antietam, saw the Dunker Church, saw that it was still there and you could go back to that place. And my whole life changed there and would have never met my wife or had my kids if it, if, uh, and I remind them of that all the time when I travel and do Civil War things. Uh, it, it's all because of Bill's work. Let's go down to Tim. Well, I, I think that um, I had a huge interest in American history, you know, ever since I can remember. So I know in um, first grade when we went to the library and all the other kids were, you know, looking at uh, um, cartoon books and I wandered over to the, what is it, 900? 973. 973 <laughs> section. <laughs> and I, I was looking at Civil War books, you know. I was always interested in it. And, you know, I did read some books about the Battle of Gettysburg uh, when I moved from Baltimore up into um, Carroll County. But then, um, at some point, my next-door neighbor was a high school teacher, and he had stolen Bill's book from <laughs> the school library. <laughs> and uh, he said I should read it, and he lent it to me. So <laughs> I read a stolen copy of his book early on. <laughs> And of course, I, w I was really, really, really into the whole concept of the photojournalism and using the photograph as a document. And, um, and when I was a kid, it, uh, I used to go to flea markets and I'd buy postcards of the battlefield. And then I would take the postcard out to the site and line them up. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. What was the book I signed for you when you were 16? Uh, when I was 16, um, that same neighbor... <laughs> We, uh, my parents had gotten me uh, Antietam, uh, the photographic legacy of America's bloodiest day. And I learned uh, through a friend, it was a battlefield guide, it was a dinner party, and William Frasinito might show up at the dinner, dinner party. So I, uh, you know, kind of got invited to the dinner party, <laughs> and I, you know, went there. It was in Hershey. And... Uh, Bill did show up, and Bill signed my book for me, and, and so we met. the Antietam book. Yeah, the Antietam Go book. On. And then, I'll never forget, my neighbor, who drove me to this event, um, he showed you the, you know, he wanted you to sign his Gettysburg book, and you were like, the cover page is missing. I'll bet you this is stolen from a library. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to, uh, thanks. Just, just see, before we move on to Sue, and then, of course, to Bill. Just so you know what type of person you're dealing with here. This is someone who has confessed that he would write book reports on his own in fifth grade, like not assigned by the school. So uh, you should be disturbed by this. Uh, 
Who are you talking about? Tim. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, if it's not clear, I meant Tim. And we'll work up in a crescendo here. So Sue, then we'll go to Bill. Okay. So I, like Gary, did not like history. Um, to me, dead men and dates weren't that interesting. So um, it wasn't until I actually acquired a diary that was written by a Civil War veteran from my home area. And that really, really kind of, it, it just tickled my interest not only in history, but specifically in, in the Civil War. And the closest battlefield I could reach at the time was Gettysburg. So me not being a, a real good directional person, I am so directionally challenged, it isn't even funny. I mean, I can't get out of a dentist office. And I've been there 20 times. So, yeah, I know I'm a guy, just don't even connect the two. <laughs> <laughs> just forget I said that, okay? But anyway, so I really, really, really wanted to come to Gettysburg, but I really, really didn't know my way around, and so enter Bill's book, because I'm so visual. And so the way I learned this battlefield was to take that <laughs> book out and refine everything he already found. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Made it a lot easier. But anyway, um, so that was, my, that was my introduction to Gettysburg, and it never stopped. So I'm a guide because of that book. There's, it's a direct link. There's no way around it. All right, Bill. I guess you can't say it was because of Bill. I guess you can. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, what's your way in? Well, in 2010, I gave a two-hour and 45-minute talk for the Center for Civil War Photography detailing the whole story of how I got interested in military history, the Civil War, the photographs, and this detective story, and all the way through Vietnam, surviving that and having my first book published. And uh, there's over 100 slides. Uh, there's six parts. And for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, just Google. It's not on YouTube, but Google Frasinito Image Part 1, and that'll take you to the first part. Each part has me speaking behind the lectern. You scroll down the slides, and then there's me behind the lectern, and then you lectern, and you scroll down. But anyway, this gets into my story, and um, I've, I've always been fascinated by time and the passage of time and how we're, it's all connected by dates. But I trace my interest in this whole story to the fact that I am the definition of the term baby boomer. And if you're not familiar with the term, I'm sure you have a lot of boomers here. The war ended in 1945. Millions of servicemen came home. They had been away from home for a, a long time. And the babies started arriving in 46. Well, it turns out my father um, was uh, aboard a submarine tender and served in the Pacific for 15 months, got home from the Pacific in December of 1945, rejoined his wife and toddler son, and I arrived exactly nine months later, so I was <laughs> literally part of the victory celebration. <coughs> and my mother told me that we were originally called victory babies. They didn't know that boom was going to go on and on and on. But um, I was always fascinated by the fact that my pop was in the war. He was in the Navy. So uh, by the time of my fourth birthday, I desperately wanted a sailor suit. And the first slide of me in this massive program that I gave is little Bill Frasinito standing on his front steps wearing his sailor suit. And another piece of neat trivia about being a baby boomer born in September of 1946. One month before I was born, in August of 46, President Bill Clinton was born. One month before he was born, in July of 46, President George W. Bush was born. And one month before he was born, in June of 46, President Donald Trump was born. So most people don't realize that three presidents were born a month apart. And even though I'm fourth on the list, I've already made my decision not to run. So. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, so um, in 1952, I grew up on Long Island, Nassau County. And in 1952, um, we got our first television set. And one of the very first ever aired TV documentaries was called Victory at Sea. And I was fascinated by that. And um, that got me further into World War II. Then, 1955, the Davy Crockett craze swept and all of us boomers were just totally enamored with Davy Crockett. 
So that whole thing with the Battle of the Alamo took me back to the 19th century. And uh, in 1955, um, in September, I had just started the fourth grade, and we used to get Life magazine. And uh, the September 12th issue featured an article on the Civil War, and that fascinated me and sparked my interest in the war. And there was this wonderful map showing little soldiers traveling around to the different battlefields, and that's probably the first time I ever saw words like Gettysburg and Antietam. And uh, the next, okay, that was in September of 55. The next April, for Easter vacation, I had relatives that lived in Catonsville, Maryland, outside of Baltimore, and we used to visit them every Easter. And it turns out my Uncle Bob was a Civil War buff, and when he found out his little nine-year-old nephew was getting interested in the war, he said, well, you know, Gettysburg isn't very far from here. Would you like to visit the battlefield? And I just, that's just, a, uh, so we went there, and it blew my mind, little round top devil's den, and then it just, it just captivated me. And um, then following September, 1956, my mother took me into um, the Scribner bookstore in New York City. Ironically, they would become my first publisher, but I, for my birthday, I bought my very first book illustrated with Civil War photographs. It was called Divided We Fought, and it's the first time I ever saw these dramatic photos of Dead of the 24th Michigan at McPherson's Woods and Dead of the 1st Minnesota. And um, in the introduction to this book, they paid homage to Miller's 1911 10-volume photographic history of the Civil War, which had, they said, some 3,800 Civil War photographs. A book, they said, was long out of print and would probably remain so indefinitely. And I just wondered if I'd ever get a chance to see this book, because they didn't have it at my elementary school library, they didn't have it at the town library. And as chance would have it, the next year, for the very first time, it was reprinted as a five-volume set, and I got that for Christmas that year. And that's the first time I started seeing other dramatic photos of dead bodies at Gettysburg, and I started noticing some of the bodies were the same bodies, but the captions were different, and that began this, this detective story that would go on for eventually five years. And fortunately, I went to Gettysburg College, and... Um, became a battlefield guide at the age of 19. And um, I needed a car when I got my guide license because when you went to the college campus, it was easy to walk to Culp's Hill in the first day's battlefield in the town and Cemetery Hill, but you couldn't take little trips down to Devil's Den every other day. So I needed a car and then with the car I got, I had access, unlimited access. And after five years of searching, I, it blew my mind, but I discovered that all the traditional captions for these photographs were incorrect. And I discovered that key rock, the split rock. So that's how my story begins with this massive detective story that's linked to my pop returning from World War II. That's great, Bill. We're gonna stick with you again. <laughs> no, actually, we say it's fascinating. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you over the years, he, he's careful about how he's allowing his name to be butchered. <laughs> there's, there's certain things like that he likes and others he doesn't, if I may speak for you, sir. Um, sticking with you then, uh, this, so you started making these discoveries, by chance, your biggest ones, uh, the year I was born. Uh, what was the reaction? I know you kept it pretty close to your vest for a while, but when, you, when people did find out what you were doing, I mean, did you already know it was something special and seminal? What's your whole take on that, your approach? Well, actually, um, I didn't tell a lot of people what I was doing because I knew, well, I did when I was, there were, um, when you take all of these, I eventually realized that there were uh, at least 10 photographs taken of roughly 40 different bodies. And the traditional captions placed individual views at four different locations on the battlefield. And um, it wasn't until I actually discovered that all those captions, so, uh, in fact, um, interestingly enough, ha Harry Fonz used to be the, the uh, chief historian at the Gettysburg battlefield. And um, I had discussed some of my work for, with him looking at boulders. And he, used to want, he told me that he was 
They could never find the boulders in what was famously known as the slaughter pen at the foot of Little Round Top. It's a famous photograph, and there was a key boulder. I call it a table-like boulder. And Harry told me he was looking for that, and he could never find it. And I decided to just go 360 degrees around Little Round Top, and I couldn't find it. And um, it also, well, there were some puzzling things about the photograph. It doesn't show the slope as open as Little Round Top was at the time of the battle. <coughs> but anyway, to make a long story short, on March, well, no, on February 1st, 1967, when I was looking for another photograph, I discovered it in the slaughter pen. And just to gather my perspective, I just glanced around, and deep in the woods at the base of Big Round Top was that boulder that nobody could find. And I realized at that point that it wasn't the slaughter pen at the foot of Little Round Top, it was the slaughter pen at the foot of Big Round Top. But like I say, I had mentioned to Harry that I was you know, looking for photographs. But I never, once I made the discovery, I, I knew that I had a book there, and I knew that this, I, I couldn't let this information become general knowledge years before the book came out. And um, fortunately, uh, oh no, I did work it into a master's thesis, and, uh, but again, I left out the key discoveries, and I wanted to save that. And then I had to serve two years in the Army and wound up in Vietnam. And had I not survived Vietnam, it's quite likely that those photographs would still be miscaptioned as dead of the 24th Michigan, dead of the 1st Minnesota. So there were people that knew just generally that I was interested in looking for the photographs, but they, they never knew the specifics. Right. So I'm not a linear moderator, so we're going to go all over the map here, and I'm going to ask each of you uh, this question. We'll start with Tim. You know, is there a pet peeve in the world of Civil War photography that just <laughs> drives you crazy? Something you could wave a magic wand and fix? He's probably got 50 saved up, so I knew I could ask him first. Yeah, pet peeves. Well, my pet peeve is people who think they find the site of historical photograph and are way off. That's obviously, uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes I, I'm excited for the person because they're going through the process, and I think the process is very important of, taking a historical image and trying to locate and identify when and where that image was taken. But um, uh, sometimes people are too easily convinced that they're right about uh, when they make a major discovery, that's all. Well, I feel the need to comment on that before he hands it over to Sue, just because, man, does that drive me crazy. That wasn't even what I was gonna say, but people, who follow this type of work would know that there's no more careful historian I've ever met than Bill. And when he says in his book, there can be no question, that's a quote, there can be no question, there really is no question. It's a good thing about photographic research. We should be able to nail it right down. And people, instead of trying to prove themselves wrong, are trying to convince themselves that they are right. And it drives us all nuts. And uh, social media has made it worse. I'll stop there. Sue? I think my most frustrating thing is because I'm drawn to images. I think what frustrates me the most is people who publish little articles, especially especially now that online publishing is so widespread, so everybody now is a historian. And so when they put images up there and they never ever cite them. Mm -hmm. And we know that many of them that are so rare have come out of his books. And so it, it's just it's just frustrating that you can't backtrack and find out where they got that. I've got two contenders on who exactly you mean. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> um, I'll add on there, the number one thing drives me the most crazy is that Bill demonstrated, at least for Gettysburg, that a corpse was moved, the dead sharpshooter, home of the rebel sharpshooter. Bill demonstrated it's the only known instance where it happened, but because it happened once, people figure, they say it every day on social media, Brady, it's not even Brady, <laughs> are, are dragging bodies around all the time. And man, the, the idea of in, in a normal world, when something happens once, you don't just assume it's happened a thousand times or every time, and that's exactly what's happening. It's driving me crazy. But more importantly, Bill, what's your answer to this question? Well, interestingly enough, um, you have to understand that Gardner was not a professional photojournalist as we have him today. He was just uh, an, uh, basically an artist. He had a gallery, and he was just responding to this one situation. 
and so a lot of people condemn him and I'm just so thankful that he got here when he did and took the photographs that he did and again it's the only time during the war that a, an actual body was moved was moved to t take a better photograph but you have to put it in perspective of who he was what he was doing here and not judge it by modern standards of photojournalism so I'm just very thankful that he got here and took the photos that he did. You make that point in your book that it might seem like a series taken in, in later after the battle, a little bit post-war, by Peter Weaver, that they're just nature scenes. <laughs> but he invariably captured parts of the battlefield that nobody else did. Um, sticking with you, Bill, uh, you know why why the ACHS? Why did you why did you suddenly? Because I've been wanting to see your collection for a long time, and I've seen little drips and drabs. Why why do this exhibit here? Why did you agree to it? Because they asked me for it. <laughs> 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 now, I, I have to say that I, I, when I got involved with the Historical Society when I was at college, Charlie Gladfeld was the executive director. And uh, I spent a lot of time here. And um, I have long ago decided that my entire collections are going to be donated to the Adams County Historical Society. So. <laughs> So can you, Bill, and then we'll move on, and I'll ask, I'll ask uh, you know, Bill and uh, Tim and Sue the same question. Why? Why does this approach resonate? Why is it thrilling to find one of these places where a Civil War photographer stood long ago? Why, can you put your finger on why this resonates with people? Well, it's, it's the whole journey in time concept. The fact that you stand at that spot, the boulder's still there, you can touch it. So it's a personal identification with the site and through the site what happened there a long time ago. And it's just that identification and the connection with the past through the photo and the objects in the photograph. So it's just a way of touching with a you know, different generation. And, and as I say, I've always been fascinated by the passage of time and the fact that today is tomorrow's history and today's history was one, once today. And um, I remember in 1957, um, my mother, there was a special PTA meeting in Long Island where, where I, I live. And my mother, uh, there was a raffle and my mother won this, this chest. And this was a very exciting event for me. And I asked her if I could write the date on the chest, 1957, and she said yes. And I thought, saw this as a historic moment, but like every other week, I kept going back there, and it's still like today, it's not getting older, it's not getting older. And today, 1957, is the date that never grew old, because, so the time has to pass, and then you return to the site. And But as I say, I've always been fascinated by the whole concept of time. And another thing, too, that I say, I was always, like in high school and elementary school, I was one of the only kids, kind of the oddball, interested in the past and interested in connecting with the past. And um, I've always wondered, well, since I got older, I've always wondered whether the, my friends who are also fascinated by the past, what is it that makes us different from 90% of our peers? And I've always been curious if there might be something in our DNA that, that makes us so susceptible to being fascinated by time in the past. And maybe one day they'll be able to determine that. Sue, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think he pretty much covered it, but <laughs> I, I think it's, we're social people, and I think it, it, that rock may connect us to a place, but that place connects us to people. And I think it's, it's the reality of communing with people we can't otherwise commune with. Why do people go to the Holy Land? Why do people go to these historic destinations over and over and over? It's not to see things, it's to connect with events that actually connected us to other people. Great, Tim? Um, well, I want to mention a couple things. One of them is rocks. I like rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I thought about this, you know, I probably thought about this more than a lot of people have thought about it. <laughs> but um, the reason it, it interests me when I've discovered a photograph and I realize that I'm the first person to 
stand in the place where that cameraman took that photograph since the photographer and you know since obviously the photographer knew where he took the photograph but since him uh, you know um, we're the first ones sometimes to discover these sites and for me I'm always excited when there's rocks in the photograph and if you think about it what is on the battlefield today that was there at the time of the battle there's a few houses that are there you know there's I don't know six witness trees um, there's you know so there's trees but the rocks the rock was there during the battle a soldier touched that rock you know blood spurted onto that rock you know it was there and so I see the rock in the photograph and I find that photograph that shows that rock and it means a lot to me the rock I don't I, I have no idea why and then I just want to mention that why when you're a, I think when you're a kid and something impacts you then you know it seems to resonate with you throughout throughout your life a lot of people want to return to things or do things that they did when they were younger or when they were children and for me the passage of time has a lot to do with dark shadows you know how they were going back to 1897 and there was parallel time and they went into the 1840s tim thinks that most people have seen his favorite show this is a yeah. television program with a lot of episodes. Yeah, the, so the, 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 soap, the afternoon soap opera from the 1960s uh, uh, and 70s. <laughs> um, I, I want to add, too, because Bill said it just like I would have, or I said it because Bill did. The idea of passage of time over a place, I don't know why. As, even as I was a, a failing history kid, I can remember being eight and seeing a picture from when I was four and wondering where it was taken and having the desire to go back to that place and take the picture again. Like even before I knew it was a field, you, you know, this would have been right about when Journey came out. Uh, I, 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 it was in me, so maybe it is a DNA thing, Bill. Um, let, let's talk about some of the discoveries. You talked about the slaughter pen, but we really haven't, you know, really hit in on, you know, the rose farm. But I would like it if all of us, starting with Bill, could talk about these discoveries. Which which are the most important to you, and how did it feel, and and why? Well, of course, as, um, as I say, the, uh, w w what happened was, um, was uh, let's see, 19, uh, it was early, uh, we had Christmas break and day term break, and I had a, uh, a, a photo from, was the 1870s that, that um, I had been looking for this one photograph um, uh, that turned out, this led to the slaughter pen discovery. And um, I had, as I say, I just had discovered this, this 1863 site, not from the 1863 photo, but from a post-war photo that showed a broader expanse. And I made the discovery, and this to gather my, my, my perspective, I just glanced around and then deep in the woods I saw that rock. But that was on February 1st, 1967. And I was so excited, because you never would have heard the term slaughter pen when I was a battlefield guide. The only people that knew the term were the people familiar with that famous photo, supposedly taken at the foot of Little Round Top. And uh, by the way, I think Harry Fonz had left by the time I made my discovery, so I never had an opportunity to tell him I discovered that boulder. But anyway, I was so excited to discover where the slaughter pen was. And as I say, I don't know if I had mentioned this, but when I was a guide and you would ride through Devil's Den, everything to the left of the road was completely overgrown. All the focus was on the right side of the road where the large boulders and they talk about the sharpshooters and all of that. And one of the, uh, the park's response to my book was to re eventually restore the left side of the road because it was probably the most heavily visited part of the battlefield that was completely overgrown. But anyway, I was so excited um, that I made that discovery and I just said, I just went crazy to devote complete full energy to discover that split rock that connected those 10 photographs that had been captioned as being taken all over the battlefield. Now I had looked for that boulder. I actually thought, in fact, I had contacted the Library of Congress and I sent them my first map showing that those photos were together. And I thought at that time that McPherson's Woods was probably the best site. Um, 
but I could never find the boulders because there really aren't any boulders on that part of the battlefield. So I had been looking for the boulders. I couldn't find them at any of the four sites that, that had been mentioned in the traditional captions. And what I decided to do was a completely new approach. The photographers had made this unparalleled, almost 360 degree panorama of a portion of the battlefield, which had a dense woods behind the camera, or depending on what look direction. And then out in the fields were just open fields and a distant ridge. And I knew that even though the boulders might have been destroyed when they were putting in avenues, the ridge is going to still be there. So in uh, March of 19, or probably late April and March of 1967, I decided to do a completely new approach. And I went to all the ridges on the battlefield and made hypothetical angles and then did a 180 degree switch and then walked. And on March 10th, what I was doing, I was work working with Warfield Ridge and I made a hypothetical angle and um, did a 180 and started walking, went through the woods, and I said, oh my God. And by the way, if, if I, I, I mentioned this, I think, in my talk, I had discovered that split rock my first year of guiding in 1966. Rarely did the guides go on Brook Avenue. And uh, I took a trip on Brook Avenue, took a group on Brook Avenue, and out of the left in the car, I saw in the woods this split rock, and I, I, that looked very familiar to the rock I was looking for. And by the way, that, that photograph of that rock had never been published. There's one version, but it, you can't see the rock very clearly. So, and that's why when I actually made my discovery, I made it with a sketch I made from a, a copy of that photo that, that the park had on file. But anyway, I just saw that split rock, and after the tour was, or after the day was over, I went back out there and I said, no, the, this rock is in the middle of the woods, and the park claims that the battlefield's restored the way it was, and the other rocks around seem too close. So I discovered that rock, but I completely dismissed it as the correct rock. Then, fast forward the next year, working with Warfield Ridge and doing the 180, and led me into the woods and it took me right to that same rock. And I said, whoa, this can't be just a coincidence. So I went back to my, I lived in a fraternity, Alpha Chi Rho fraternity. Are there any crows in here? All right. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a crow over there. Oh my God. Hi guys. <laughs> so um, I went back and, and I got the other books because I didn't have a photograph of the split rock but I did have photos of the others, and I went there and I said, oh my God, that's the rock. And thankfully, I was so excited, I wrote the date on the piece of paper, and the original piece of paper that I had with me with the sketch of the split rock is on display in the end. And that discovery, I said, oh my God, I knew I had a book there, and that changed my whole life. So, uh, and now that piece of paper is part of a museum. <laughs> Pretty cool. So we're going to, sticking with the discoveries, Tim, then Sue, this, you know, discoveries can take a lot of forms. It could be finding the location of a historic photo. It could be finding a photo and treating it in a way that is proper instead of the way it had been treated before. Uh, it could be a collection one where people, you know, find something that hadn't been available before. Tim? You knew I was going to ask you. <laughs> a discovery you made that you were happy with. Um, are we talking about the Elliott map? We can talk about anything. Okay. I, I, they, okay. We didn't rehearse yeah, these. Yeah, I, I think that um, the process of uh, locating photographs and I, uh, you know, one thing that I think is interesting about that of lo finding a historical photograph and you can just listen to Bill's stories is it's not something that happens in like ten minutes. So time and time and time again, when we were just talking about you know one of our pet peeves is where people find the location of a photograph that no one else knows. They come to Gettysburg for the first time, they open up a book, and boom, they found a historic site. It just doesn't work that way. I guess it could, but uh, a lot of times there's a lot of research behind the scenes that leads you to uh, find something. And sometimes you find things you're not expecting to find. Um, uh, in the case of the Elliott burial map, the story was that um, Andrew Dalton, the director here of the Adams County Historical Society, was writing an article about um, a guy named S.G. Elliott and a map that he had drawn of the Gettysburg battlefield after the battle that showed dead on the battlefield. 
And uh, there were two different versions in the map. Um, we don't, even though it seemed like one was published in Philadelphia and one in New York, uh, it didn't seem like that there were more than three or four known copies in the map. So I decided to search some different repositories and there's lots of online catalogs. You can't just Google something and it comes up, but you can go to a, a public repository like the Philadelphia Free Library or the New York Public Library, and you can get onto their search engines and search for stuff in their collections. And so what I was trying to do was to um, find, uh, I was trying to find something to help verify which copy of the Elliott burial map from Gettysburg was the one that was published and if it was ever published and where copies existed. Simple thing. And I went to the New York Public Library, put in Elliott's name, and a map popped up and it allowed me to download it. And I chose the New York Public Library because they're one of the places that had recently digitized their map collection. So just because of the field I'm in, I knew that they had a digitized map collection of you know, thousands and thousands of maps. So it came up, I downloaded the map, and when it came up, you know, it didn't look like Gettysburg. I saw the Hagerstown Road and I was moving it around. I didn't understand where we were. And then I realized it was the Antietam battlefield. Now, the discovery then, like Gary's talking about, I know a lot about Antietam and I knew immediately that no one had ever seen that map before that was educated about the Battle of Antietam. Other people had seen that map. The people had digitized that map, had seen that map for the New York, the New York, it was in the collection of the New York Public Library. Obviously they knew they had it, but none of those people knew how rare this map was. So, you know, it's very satisfying when you can bring something that people don't realize to the attention of others and say, hey, this is rare. And it happens in photography all the time in the case that, um, you know, on eBay, you know, there's photographs sold by Tipton and uh, Tyson and, and Weaver, these Gettysburg or these photographers that took Gettysburg photographs. But which photograph is a rare, never, never been seen photograph and which one is a common photograph that's been reproduced over the years many, many times? And, you know, it takes a little bit of... Uh, uh, knowledge to know that. So sometimes you're just the one who facilitates bringing to light the fact that, hey, here is a new rare photograph. And also the process of taking the photograph out onto the battlefield and lining it up and finding out where the image is. Sometimes you learn something by doing that that no one realized before about the area of the battlefield or where the wood line was at the time of the battle or you know, where a fence was located or something historic about the image. Good, and Sue, you're not only a guide, but also a, a collector of some note. So, d any discovery come to mind in terms of an image or something on the field? Not on the field, per se. But um, a lot of you know that I'm known as the Cyclo Queen and I'm still looking for the corner in the round room. <laughs> I'm never, <laughs> gonna, never gonna find it. But anyway, I had the privilege of being on the conservation team when our Gettysburg Cyclorama was conserved. And so a lot of things along the, throughout the process became challenges. And one of them was the discovery that 14 feet of the Gettysburg Cyclorama was missing. So the they wanted to restore it, to put it all back into its original 377 foot circumference because we only had 356 feet. So my job as a historian was to go figure out what was missing. Okay, so the prevailing history said there were four versions of the Gettysburg Cyclorama. There, there was a Chicago version, a Boston version, a um, New York version, and a, what am I missing? <laughs> Philadelphia version. And so each of them, when they were put on display, had photographs taken of them, which were then sold as souvenirs. So all four versions of the original Gettysburgs, all by the artist Paul Philippoteau, who created the original drawings, were all available if you knew what you were looking for and what you were looking at. So um, I collected cyclorama long before it was a cool thing to collect. So I had a lot of the Philadelphia, the Chicago, the Boston, and the, the one currently in Gettysburg, which was New York, or sorry, which was, well, never mind, it was Boston. But anyway, so I 
we laid them all out and the conservator had already had a history of looking into these cycloramas by going to Wake Forest University and looking at a, a, a Gettysburg cyclorama in their collection that was Chicago. So they were, in fact, what they had done originally was go to, the, go to that version of it, photograph the whole thing. They had it rolled out along a football field, photographed the whole thing, and they were comparing the version Gettysburg had and that version to see which one was more able to be brought back 100%. And there was a slight chance early on that we would have ended up with that one. But in any case, by the way, we have the Boston one. Uh, but in any case, throughout the research, since I had sets of all four images, I discovered that the one in Wake Forest was not one of the four originals, as first thought. It was said to be the Chicago only because it was viewed at the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. So since it was seen in Chicago, bingo, it's the Chicago version. Not quite. Um, what happened to the Chicago version was it was destroyed. So fortunately, we didn't get that one at Wake Forest, or it wouldn't have been one of the original four. But in any case, it was kind of a cool feeling, and I'm, Bill's gone through this feeling 9,000 times, I only went through it once, that I was actually able to add to the body of knowledge that heretofore had either not been known or had been known incorrectly. So that was my big discovery, was that we, that was a Wake Forest, it was a Chicago version, but not the original, and it didn't match the other four. Thanks, Sue. I'll, I'll just throw in or tip in because most of my favorite discoveries are actually following in Bill's footsteps during that 20-year period between his first two Gettysburg books where, you know, he knew things already, but we didn't have that information. Bill even offered to tell Tim and I, do you want me to tell you? Like, and we never, that wasn't my full Bill accent, by the way. That was, that was only a partial, uh, you know, but no, we always said no and we started looking for him. But, you know, certainly I, I get that feeling, Sue. Uh, I've done a lot of work with Atlanta and a little bit with Manassas and some with Cumberland Landing. In every one of those cases, it's where the phot photographs were originally captioned wrong. The Cumberland Landing things were really at Yorktown. The uh, Blackburn's Ford is in fact at neither of these fords, but rather at a railroad bridge. And that these things taken supposedly south and east of Atlanta were in fact all taken north of Atlanta. And that's very satisfying, but my Gettysburg ones, it's definitely finding the famous all over now picture. The five dead in the woods on what we now call the trolley path. And, uh, um, the, what we call the fortress rock, the one dead guy inside the triangular field, all of which Bill had already, Bill or one other guy had already found long before that. And there's a certain satisfaction that, com that comes from finding it yourself. Mm -hmm. Even taking Bill's book out, I see people doing it all the time, taking the book out and making that journey and being able to experience the journey in time. Um, I'm gonna go straight into something else for the whole panel, but I'm gonna start with uh, Bill, um, this idea of what discoveries have yet to be made about Civil War <laughs> photography? What, what do you really mm. hope to see while we're still walking this earth? Or what will emerge that we don't yet know about? There, there's, you know, there's a great example of, uh, of a photo in this exhibit that uh, you know, we didn't even know existed until someone in this room actually was able to acquire it and let uh, the ACHS use it. So Bill, does anything come to mind? Well, um, you know, one of the... Uh, uh, Photographs, the one that, that in the cemetery that, that shows Lincoln, Josephine Cobb identified as Lincoln, I think back in the 50s, we've determined was taken by Bacharach. And um, this is updated in my early photography at Gettysburg. And there's only one photo taken from that particular stand. And there's no way that a photographer would come all the way to Gettysburg and photograph that ceremony and only take one photograph. So we know there have to be photographs that are still waiting to be discovered. And um, what I'm proud of in my, my books is that I've laid the foundation for any future discoveries that are made to be able to link them to the, to the whole picture. Uh, but, and as, as far, now we have all of Gardner's, all of Gardner's photographs have been accounted for. Um, I can't really think of uh, anything that were now the um, the, the uh, we Weaver photographs of the posed bodies in Devil's Den. Um, 
nine have surfaced now, and it's conceivable that others will surface. And by the way, my, my one of my most dis proudest connections with with uh, how many here have read my early photography at Gettysburg? Okay. And how many have not read early photography? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I was going to tell the story of Jacob Schenkel, and I don't, have, I guess, have to repeat that again. But for those of you who haven't read early photography, uh, in Journey in Time, it was obvious to me that there was a group of photographs taken by Weaver that were posed bodies in Devil's Den. They were not real bodies. And um, the most obvious thing is that there's not a single leaf on any of the trees or bushes, and uh, the soldiers are, are in different positions, uh, even though the camera angle hasn't changed and there's lots of rifles. So I surmised in my er journey in time that um, these photos were probably taken around the time of the Gettysburg Address. When would there be that many soldiers available in the fall of 1863? So that's what I projected in, in the book. And then uh, in the 1980s, I gave a talk in East Liverpool, Ohio, and uh, one of the, my fans came up and introduced himself, Tim Brooks, and he was an attorney in East Liverpool, Ohio. And uh, so I met Tim. And then uh, months after that, I got a late night phone call from him with this amazing story. And um, he told me that uh, he also was interested in World War I. And this one day in one of the towns around that the, he, uh, this lady had, a, there were yard sales, and this lady had a World War I uniform for sale. So he bought the uniform, and then she invited him in the house because she had some other stuff for sale. And when he was in the house on the desk on the left, there were some tin types of a Civil War soldier. So we asked who the soldier was, and she said he was the ancestor of someone that lived in the house. The soldier's name was Jacob Shankel, 62nd Pennsylvania. So Tim asked if they were for sale, and she said yes, so she bought them. And then as he was researching Jacob Shankel, he found out that there was another descendant that lived in California who had Shankel's 1863 diary. So Tim contacted this guy and asked if he could see the diary, and the guy just gave it to him. He had no use for it. So Tim had this 1863 diary. It turns out Shanko was an adult, but he was a musician. And it, the job of musicians when the fighting starts is to take care of wounded soldiers. So Shanko remained behind as when the 62nd left uh, Gettysburg and the campaign continued. So he's reading the diary, and into the fall, Shanko winds up at Camp Letterman, first at field hospitals, then at Camp Letterman with and uh, every once in a while, he and his buddies went into town to get, what, three sheets to the wind or something like that. They go out <laughs> drinking. And on the entry for November 10th, 1863, Schenkel mentions that he and some of his buddies went into town, and, uh, went, and an artist went to a gallery and had their picture taken. And the next day, the artist asked them to go out on the battlefield and pretend they were dead and skirmishing and everything. And Tim Brooks said, oh my God, that has to be those posed photos. And thank God he had a picture. He had tintypes of Schenkel. So we were able to make that connection. And Schenkel can be identified in the photographs. And we now know the date was November 10, uh, 11, 11th, yeah, 1863, taken by Weaver. And uh, he obviously was taking these photographs to sell to the thousands of people that would be here, you know, eight days later, or yeah, eight days later. But anyway, uh, now in the diary, Schenkel mentioned that they went out also posed as skirmishers, and we had never seen a photograph of the group posing as skirmishers until Tim brought to my attention a group of Weaver views that were for sale, and I bought the whole group, and in there was an unpublished photo no one had ever seen before of the same group of guys the depicting the first reenactment at the Battle of Gettysburg by actual soldiers. And um, you can p I can pick out Schenkel in the photograph, and that's one of the ones that's on display. No one had ever seen that photo. And then there was that other photograph. Um, in my early photography at Gettysburg, there's a group of civilians with the soldiers in front of the large boulders. And one of the strange things about those Weaver photographs, this is in November of 1863, 
Gardner, Brady, Tyson's, nobody showed any interest in those large boulders until Weaver took that series. And you just think that that would have attracted broader attention. So anyway, um, there was this group of civilians in the one photo that's published in my early photography, but no one knew who the civilians were. And in the group that, that Tim brought to my attention, they're on their original mounts. And on the back of the mount, there's that same group of civilians in the um, slaughter pen area. And on the back, it mentions that it was General Reynolds' brother and uh, friends were in the photographs. So we now know who those people were. But again, these photos, one by one, they just started surfacing. And there could very well be more that would surface in the future. So I've laid the foundation for any future you know, discoveries that are made. They'll know how to, what kind of a context to put them into. To this day, I still, something comes up, I, I look and read in your book and in the footnotes because that foundation is real. Uh, you, you can see it. We don't have too much time left, but I do want to talk about discoveries. But before I do, I think a few people in the room might smile or chuckle, and I hope you don't mind, Bill. You said that Tim Brooks gave you a late night call. Given your sort of legendary odd schedule that you keep, what in the world is a late night call to you? It wasn't that late. I've, I've always been a night person. And uh, because uh, when you're working for yourself and writing books, you can go to your own schedule. And uh, I usually get up around 4 in the afternoon and go to bed around 6 in the morning. <laughs> So I have, and that's, that's how I, you know. <laughs> So Tim called it breakfast. Now, when I, with, with <laughs> Tim, yeah, I'd have to go back to my, it was just an e evening phone call, let's put it that way. All right. Yeah, yeah. Great, well, let me move on to Tim real quick. Smith, that is, uh, you know, about what's, in brief, <laughs> a discovery you hope gets made. Okay, uh, in brief, well, I was just going to mention that uh, photographs, rare photographs continue to surface of the battlefield of Gettysburg, and there's every reason to believe that there's some more out there. And one comes to mind that we put on display in Bill's gallery is uh, the discovery a few years ago, just everybody seemed to make it on eBay, was a photograph of the Jacob Stockhouse by Samuel Fisher Corliss. And he's a photographer we know was here uh, sometime around the time of the Gettysburg Address and took other photographs. And here was a brand new photograph. And uh, uh, the gentleman who uh, purchased it is sitting in the audience tonight who allowed us to have it on display in that gallery. So, um, I you know, I, I, I'm just always amazed when a new photograph of something dramatic appears. And we know that there are photographs taken by the, um, the Weavers, the Stereo Series in 1867, and we don't have all of them. So we know there's more out there. We know that Charles Himes recorded a series of 20-some images on the battlefield at least, and we've seen like four of them. So we know there are, they exist. Uh, are they out there somewhere in some private collection and they'll, they'll appear? That would be great. My dream, of course, and I don't know if you know what I'm gonna say, Gary, is we know almost nothing about Alexander Gardner's itinerary from him about the Antietam and Gettysburg photographs. We look at these photographs and you know people surmise which direction he went, which photographs he took and where he went. I wanna see an Alexander Gardner diary telling me what day he took the photographs and tell me his path on the battlefield. I mean, like you would say it, wow. <laughs> 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 All right, Sue. Well, I have a series of early Weaver photo stereo views. Now, they, d he, they, and you know a lot more about these, the GEM series came out uh, 68, 60, 67, 67, 8, 67. okay. Some of the ones I acquired from a grouping out of Philadelphia were, I had never seen the majority of them. There were, I think I had 30 of them. And what's interesting about them is they, they, all the notations on them were all in handwritten. They weren't for public consumption. They all had Rufus Weavers you know, from the collection of. So they were, may very well have only been one of a kinders or two of a kinders. And as, as you all have alluded, since we don't have a catalog saying there was number one through 57, we have no idea what's out there. And the only reason they came out at the time where they were out of, of the Weaver's estate, some descendant had let them go. So 
as far as I'm concerned, weavers are the little gems that I would like to see come up because I'm getting real good at picking them out. There's not a whole lot of markings on the on the cards, but after a while, I think you can allude that there, you get to know the photographer's style after a while. So that's what I'd like to see is a whole lot more weavers come out because they're so early. And they went to places other people didn't tend to go. Yes. Well, thank you. I, uh, as the moderator, I get to say all these things whatever I want now. So uh, <laughs> in terms of discoveries, I mean, outside of the John Wilkes Booth autopsy, we know it was taken. We, if we think that the print and the plate were destroyed, but we just don't know. I have some hope in a morbid sense that that will appear one day. Of course, I hope somebody finds the harvest of death conclusively. Uh, that is the five negatives of two different photos, you know, or two different directions of a group of uh, dead on the battlefield. But that, that harvest of death one is only one of the 10 different sets of photos and drawings in a binder I made 12 years ago that said, entitled, I've never told anybody this, photos I'll find this year. <laughs> 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 and, and I haven't found one of them. Um, they're Alfred Wads, they're Brady's, they're Gardner's, they're, they're you know, later 1860s ones. So I just hope somebody uh, is able to discover a whole lot of these photos. Now, we're going to end with one last one before we bring up uh, Andrew and that. I'm going to start with Bill, then go to Tim and Sue. Uh, do people, I know you're not a movie star, Bill, but you might be called a rock star. Do people quote your writing back to you. And then I'm going to ask Tim and Sue if they have any lines that they would like to say from Journey in Time or otherwise. Do people, do people seem to remember what you wrote better than you do? In actual quotes? Yes. Th yeah, that's what level we're at now. I think you're going to hit me with something Oh, right Oh, I'm ready to. Well, we, yeah, Tim no, and I could do it all day. No, I don't hear people <laughs> quoting me you know, off the top of their head. All right, well, well is, there a, is there a line from any of your books that really stands <laughs> out? Uh, you know, uh, that war is the greatest of obscenities or that... I have, to, I have to go over my books again. All right. Well, Tim, save me here, man. What comes to mind? Uh, one thing, um, he, he was describing a, a rock on the Rose Farm and the rock uh, was still there, oh, yes. but it was upside down in the earth. And he mentioned that it's heavier than it looks. Maybe indicating that he tried to pick it up at some point. <laughs> but... Um, Gary and I would often uh, go out with Fraz on our, um, ex you know, on our dinner excursions or at the Reliance Mind Saloon, and we talked to him about things. And we'd often would, not just that one, but we'd quote back to him things in his books, and he would know it. Like, uh, Gary, could you hand me that glass? It's heavier than it looks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> and I always got a big kick of that. But, um, um, uh, you know, the, the quote of the... Uh, uh, soldier that you were just talking about finding, you probably do it better than me, of the, um, the dead soldier in a slaughter pen. That's one that we continuously quote. Uh, well, just for the good of the audience, uh, uh, what is it? A bloated and drenched by recent showers and emitting odors of the most offensive nature, this poor soul had been lying motionless in death for nearly four days when his distorted form attracted the attention of Alexander Gardner. And, and it's, this is how, I mean, it's kind of clunky, you know, the way that Tim would say, you know, we'd say, oh, that rock looks like that rock is heavier than it looks. Um, you know, we would actually name the rock based on what Bill used to say. But I, I just want to say in front of you, Bill, because I don't think you know it, my favorite happens to be uh, when you're talking about what, what people now regularly call the Forbes boulder, uncovered um, on Culp's Hill with some of the woods clearing. I always called it the Confederate sharpshooter rock. This is that large boulder down the hill a little bit. And Bill was talking about that one rock and another boulder up the hill. And he said that the scenes those boulders witnessed that warm summer evening were forever locked within. And that idea of witness trees, witness boulders, or in terms of Civil War photography, witness glass. You know, that, that witness that saw the events. Of course, I tell people this, and I'm regularly told that trees don't have eyes or ears, <laughs> and that boulders don't have eyes or ears. I know this, but <laughs> Tim, it looks like you want to say something else. If not, hand it to Sue. One more thing I'll, I'll say. I got to tell this story. I, I wrote this story down at the beginning when we got here, and um, Bill, I'm sure, is going to hate this story. Um, but. You know, talking about people who take Bill's stories and they have to build on them. And of course, we're licensed battlefield guides. You know, we tell stories about the battle. And uh, some of the guides go more into stories than others. But um, I'll never forget, and I had to tell Bill this story later, but one of the guides told me um, early on that Bill had discovered the site yes. of the Rose Farm Rock in the Rose Farm series. And he was very excited about it. But then, of course, he had to serve in Vietnam. And Bill was really worried that this secret would die with him. 
So Bill wrote up all this information, put it in an envelope, put the photographs in with it, and sent the envelope to Shelby Foote oh. <laughs> to be opened upon his death. <laughs> Never happened. And this tour, <laughs> this tour guy was telling people this story. Who, who tells that story? Oh, I can't. I don't uh, But I think his, his initials were VN, if I'm correct. Yeah? Sue, anything to add to this? Only that I try not to quote living people because then when I get it wrong, they won't get upset. <laughs> Especially when he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> so, no thanks. I'll pass. <laughs> well, thanks, Sue. And I'm going to invite Andrew back up. But first, one more important piece of business here, guys. Look. Oh, yeah. Andrew, come on up. Thanks to the panelists and to Bill so much. Just want to add, once again, it was just such a pleasure to share this very historic day with all of you for the Adams County Historical Society, but for Gettysburg and for Civil War history more broadly and American history. So thank you to our wonderful panel. Thank you for being here today. We'll see some of you tomorrow for the next part of our series. And uh, thanks for supporting the Historical Society. It means a lot to all of us. <laughs>